All right, hello and welcome to all of our viewers joining us on ClickOrlando.com for this 8.30 uh, session. We have our legal analyst here, Mark O'Mara. Good morning. And uh, I'm morning anchor Kirsten O'Connor, and we are talking about the North Salmon trial. Today uh, we have some pretty big events happening, so let's talk about what we can expect today in court. Well, you know, this is the government's presentation, so now they get to move forward. They started yesterday with a couple of the witnesses, actually several witnesses, that showed the jury what was happening inside Paul. There's a question as to whether or not that is particularly relevant to what Ms. Salmon did, but there's no question the government is trying to bring the jury into the event that happened that, mo that night, uh, because in effect they've got to get the jury upset with Mateen and then have that carry over to the uh, anger with Ms. Salmon. And I know that you've been speaking a lot with our investigator Mike DeForest outside of the courtroom kind of mm -hmm. doing some rehashing uh, right after every one of these days of uh, trial and I heard part of the conversation last night was is it relevant? Do we need to be talking about Omar Mateen for this long? Um, how does that relate to Nor Salmon? Obviously she's the wife so she had to have known his character traits in some way but but are we getting over a little bogged down with, with Mateen? Well, the government is given great latitude, like all of us are, in presenting their case. And they're allowed to set the foundation. So in one sense, if I was the prosecutor, I would say, look, we have to give some three dimension to this. We have to let this jury know everything that was happening, because only by showing them what was happening inside who Mateen was can we then show what she knew. The other side of it is the defense who's going to say, no one's arguing that Mateen is a monster. As a matter of fact, uh, Ms. Moreno said that in her opening. So they're trying to distance themselves from Mateen. And what they would be saying, and I'm sure what they're going to say in closing, is why did the government present all that information to you when Judge Byron has just told you, as he will in closing arguments, um, that emotions are not supposed to enter into this case. So mm -hmm. it's going to be an interesting dynamic as they go back and forth. And as you speak about emotion, obviously yesterday was an emotional day. Uh, we heard from witnesses, people who were actually inside the Pulse nightclub when the shooting was happening. There were some 911 calls that were played. Um, and we kind of, because we had all of that witness testimony, we kind of haven't talked a lot about the opening statements themselves. Mm -hmm. What did you think about the opening statements? Well, the opening statement from the government was good. It was brisk and to the point, like it was supposed to be. Um, holding or pulling back no punches. What he has to convince, or what the government has to convince this jury is, she knew so much that we have to presume she knew all of it. And they have to get that across. They have to show the connection between husband and wife. The fact that they're sitting in a, in a living room together, or they're watching TV together, or they're casing a joint together, as they say. The more connection they can make between the two, the better chance of conviction of Salmon. So I thought the, uh, the initial government opening was exactly what it should have been. To the point, precise, and guilty, guilty, guilty. Now to talk about the defense, they did and have to do the exact opposite, which is she's not the monster, so what does she say? She's not the monster, she's the mother. Uh, and make the separation between the two. Talk a little bit about the inequity in the relationship. They didn't go into the abuse very much because they have to be careful how that's going to come out in trial, but they have to show that this mom is just a mom and is not the monster that her husband is. I know a lot of times, uh, as we've been leading up to this point, they've painted the picture that Nor Salman is a mother, she uh, had a low IQ, and was abused by Omar Mateen. Why do you think they didn't focus on that so much? Well, I think they have to be careful because that we know if from what we get the insight that they're going to have some experts on interrogation, for example. Was she properly or improperly interrogated? We know they're going to try and bring in some expert about whether or not she was abused. But here's the caveat. Most of the abuse testimony, most of that evidence that the jury is going to be able to look at, pretty much has to come from Ms. Salmon's own words. And that, dis that, that decision to have her testify is fraught with difficulties. It is never a good decision to have your client testify. We sort of in the criminal defense bar call the worst witness we could ever possibly have is our own client. So I think what they're trying to do is hedge their bet against the reality that they may not have Ms. Salmon testify. Okay, so they're not going to rely on her. They're going to try to rely on everything else before exactly. putting her up on the exactly. stand. All right, so what else can we expect uh, for today? I know that we, we 
heard a lot of witness testimony yesterday. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll hear more of that today? We're going to hear a lot of the building blocks of the federal uh, government's case. They, they now have put the emotion out there. They're now going to they spend some time on the, the Pulse event. Now they have to start tying the two together. Now they're going to start talking about the coincidence. Now they're going to start talking about some of the forensic evidence that does support the connection. And I presume in the next couple of days, maybe today would be too early, next couple of days we're going to start hearing about the uh, evidence and testimony that Ms. Salwin gave to the FBI, because that's the entirety of their case, is what she said to the FBI. Mm -hmm. And that's not uh, recorded. That's something that we have uh, in writing, correct? Again, a, a real frustration of mine and most criminal defense attorneys because we know that everybody has a video camera in their pocket with an iPhone, and the idea that the decision was made by the FBI not to audio tape this and not to videotape it, I think is going to be very problematic. And I think the jury should say, as I'm sure the defense is going to point out, why don't we have a videotape? Why don't we have an audio tape? Why are we have to being required to rely on a written statement and something prompted by the FBI, particularly when we now know the, gu the defense is going to go after that very point? Mm -hmm. And the point would be that it was a false uh that's what they're hoping to prove, is that uh, she said something she didn't mean to say. Well, you know, we know that there are false confessions out there. I'm not saying this is one, it may not be. But because the, the potential of a false confession or an inaccurate confession exists, why not do away or minimize that possibility by audio and videotaping it, rather than have a, a confession or statement that is open to interpretation. Mm -hmm. If it were an audio or video, I'm, now I'm just curious, sure. uh, would it help them uh, help them prove that it was not false? Well, you know, we get to look at it. So right now, if you and I have to review this very conversation, we could look at the videotape. Right. On the other hand, if we had to rely on just what you or I wrote down about what we said, we'd miss something, the nuances wouldn't be there. You know, the interaction isn't there. Body and language, yeah. Yeah, body language, and, and also the level of understanding. You know, now we know that we can understand each other. If I was speaking a different language than you were, or a language that wasn't my first language, maybe there would be more misinterpretation. Yeah. And now we just don't know. Yeah, and th but this was something that that's not new. They tend mm. to do this where they don't video record. Do you think after this case, if that, ends up being a sticking point that could change? Well, we're trying to make a change. Actually, Florida is trying to pass a law right now that requires all audio and videotaped conversations to, to be done. Um, the federal government, the FBI, traditionally does not do that. Uh, again, always been a frustration of mine and for no other reason than if you can create and, and hold on to the evidence, why not? Right. I mean, you know, in a similar sense, if, if it's a drug case, and the drug is analyzed. They're required to hold on to the drug, so maybe I want to analyze it, okay? That makes sense. Well, why not hold on to what we call the best evidence, which is the actual audio videotape of the event rather than something in writing, or sometimes just a recollection of what happened. Mm -hmm. Just a good point coming out of this, uh, Absolutely. this trial specifically. I know some of our reporters who are in the courtroom who've been coming back and talking with us in the newsroom, uh, were talking about that witness testimony yesterday and how there wasn't a lot of cross-examination going on. Mm -hmm. Why would that be? Well, one tactic, if you will, is if a witness doesn't hurt you, don't talk to them. <laughs> The, the, the worst thing you can do is have a witness who hasn't really hurt you on direct examination, and then you get up and start cross-examining that witness, and then more information comes out. And that's also a subtle signal to the jury that you don't consider the witness's testimony particularly significant. So you almost minimize it by not even bothering mm -hmm. to question. And then there's also some um, tactical reasons, for example, with those victim test uh, witnesses, those people who have been through Pulse. As re out of respect for them, why would you question them? You know, when they're recounting a traumatic event in their life, let them have their peace, let them say what they say, and then just move on. And since this is a federal court case, we don't have cameras in the courtroom. We have the sketch artists, and we've been able to mm -hmm. see a little bit of Nora Salman uh, and her expressions and, yeah. and how she's reacting to these. Was there anything visible uh, while, the, while the witnesses were up there and, and the victims themselves? Well, I will say that I was a bit concerned about her presentation during jury selection, the, the first stage. 
Um, I, there was this high five or this fist pump kind of thing. There was a couple of smiles and smirks. My only concern and what I always counsel my clients is you are always on stage, whether it's the judge looking at you, even the prosecutor looking at you, certainly when the jury is looking at you. So you need to be very respectful of the process and very aware. So I think that she needs to be very careful because we're all human. Those jurors are human beings looking for those nuances. We all make our decisions based upon, like you said, body language and the way we interact with each other. If they see something that evidences a lack of caring, a lack of concern, a lack of interest, uh, an antagonism even towards the government, that could come back and burn her very, very harshly. So mm -hmm. she needs to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was emotional in the courtroom, too, for uh, some of the families that were there yesterday listening to uh, the testimony. Well, it, it's horrific because, one, they're looking for answers. The answer seems to be that we had a monster, a, a maniac, who wanted to kill as many Americans as possible, and that's what he did. But to have to live through that again is traumatic. It's literally living through the death of a, a loved one. But I think the other thing is they want answers. And unfortunately, I don't think any answers are going to come for the Pulse victims from this trial because I don't think Ms. Salmon has very much to offer as far as answers, and I don't see how the government is going to uh, offer any other information. The one frustration I would have if I was a Pulse survivor or, or a loved one of a Pulse victim, uh, particularly in the gay community, is this event has been identified as an anti-gay event since day one. It turns out, seemingly, from last week that the focus on Pulse may have been pure coincidence. And if that's true, not that this offers a lot of solace to the gay community, but that it really was coincidental rather than being a focus on the gay community simply because they are the gay community. And I'm wondering why the government decided not to let that information out a year and a half ago to at least salve the gay community's angst and frustration about this. Mm -hmm. Still a lot of questions that we have many, many questions. about uh, when they're releasing this information. We're getting more of it every day right. of this trial. Um, things we didn't hear before, right. um, things we haven't seen before, surveillance video. Uh, pointing to where uh, Noor had been with Omar Mateen, where she hadn't been with him. Mm -hmm. So still a lot to uncover today, I'm sure. Sure. Uh, this is day two, when we know it's going to last about three or four weeks, so you can anticipate every day to have more and more of those building blocks from the prosecution's case to begin with, attempted to be knocked down by the defense cross-examination, and then the defense starts building their case to counter it. You know, the government's got to present enough evidence to convict those 12 jurors beyond a reasonable doubt that she did what they say she did. And mm -hmm. it's going to be an uphill battle. And I know the jury selection process, it was tedious. There was a lot uh, that they did beforehand to prepare for it. Um, but it actually, it went quicker, I think, than I expected at least. Well, you know, in federal court, jury selection is always, do almost always done by the, the judge alone. And the defense counsel or uh, prosecutors don't have much to do with it. In state court, of course, we have a lot involved. So we're used to a concept of a jury selection that's extended. Having said that, I thought Judge Byron did a great job of allowing the counsel to be involved in the process and to make sure that the pretrial publicity, any of the biases, didn't infect the jury. Um, so I think the timing was pretty good. They got through, it went a little bit quicker than I thought it was going to, but that's good. And I think they have a good jury. Mm -hmm. They just need to be careful because we know that there's this concept called stealth jurors, people who want to get on the panel for their own reasons, write a book, have their own biases or whatever. And somewhere between 5 or 10% of the population out there are potential stealth jurors, so they need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. I think we have a good jury and they're going to do a good trial. Yeah. Just have to keep watching. Got to watch them. All right, Mark O'Meara with us today for our uh, just quick recap on ClickOrlando.com. We're going to have another one of these coming up for you at 12:30, so stay tuned. We will also have a live report coming up during that one uh, from the courthouse. So thank you very much. Sure thing. Great to be here. And we will see you guys later on ClickOrlando.com. Take care.